off the page. My guest today is Louis Poti. Uh, he's been teaching at Concordia University. He's about to retire. And he's also been fascinated by variations of the English language for a long, long time. Hi, welcome. Good to have you in Halifax. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Now, I actually came across one of your books way, way back, 1983, here in Nova Scotia, something called The South Shore Phrase Book. And it was a dictionary of variations on the English language, all kinds of words that I'd never heard of before. Does every region have its own colorful set of language? And how does that happen? I think especially in rural places, in uh, places like Nova Scotia, there is uh, a distinct um, sort of language. Uh, what exactly we're going to call it is, a, is it's not easy because people tend to think, usually what you're talking about is non-standard language, uh, since standard implies that all across the English-speaking world there's a uniformity and this is local. But, and they, they think you're saying, well, this is not correct. It, in fact, it's communication and yeah. it's useful communication. What I was working on here was spoken language for the most part. I was it's looking kind at of slang? Would it, is colloquial. It slang? There was some slang in it. I mean, mm -hmm. when you think of, I remember, um, for it to steal something, to make love to it. There's a kind of deflating of pretense, there's yeah. a kind of jocularity about that. Right. Or a window party for someone who got angry at someone and broke all the windows in his boat. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. You, that's <laughs> that's to closer to slang, <laughs> though it is. Not all slang is colloquial speech. Uh, all, uh, all, not all colloquial speech is slang, but all, all slang is. Slang tends to be spoken. And you've been documenting this in, in many different places. Of course. Now, how did you first become interested in, in this language issue? If I could go back as far as I can remember, Take it I would back. say <laughs> that it was noticing that my mother used an expression. She would say, if it come a rain, this was in Texas when I was a little boy, if it come a rain, and I thought, oh dear, mother's made a mistake. Here was mother, a legal stenographer, uh, valedictorian of her high school graduating class and with the most beautiful uh, round hand, you know, she had penmanship, making what I thought was a mistake and then I realized it was the old subjunctive mm -hmm. that was, had fallen out of use in most people's everyday speech, but it was a, a written, formal, standard, old uh, uh, verb tense. And so I began, to, I think it was with Ken Weaver's a little paperback called Texas Crude, which turned out to be about the uh, language of oil field workers in East Texas. Oh yeah, uh, but that's a long colorful time language. ago that I realized that there was there was uh, there were words out there that people were not writing down, and that people were using, and that were useful in communication between people. It is true that I turned. Well, I've done two works on two books on on regional uh, colloquial speech or informal speech, Nova Scotia and the Eastern Townships. Then I've turned more to slang, which is, um, it's true, it's non-standard, it's informal, it's non-technical. We reserve jargon as a term, I guess, for technical speech. Yes. Uh, and it, it almost always involves a, a, a set of synonyms that are available for standard terms that have verb and color. They tend to, to punctuate pretense. They tend to have irreverence and frivolity and lots of more feeling. And so much more language. life than what us English teachers are sometimes <laughs> teaching as the proper language. Do you ever find yourself in conflict with your, your job as the English professor in this regard? No, I find that it enriches the, 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 work, the works of literature that I teach because often slang comes into them. I teach Victorian literature and uh, I teach uh, um, modern literature and slang and forms. In fact, one of my favorite, uh, what shall I say, results of my work, because my books are never going to make a lot of money, they're never going to be bestsellers, is that writers tend to use them. Uh, Robert McNeil, when he, he had a grandmother from the South Shore, but when he wrote Burden of Desire, he said, I went to your book because it reminded me of things that I'd heard from my grandmother. Ah. Interesting. Richard, yeah. George Eliot Clark, people like this. That's very gratifying because it means that my books may not sell that many copies, but the words will get out. They're there on the start. reference shelf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I see you kind of wandering around the world with uh, pieces of paper in your pocket and pens and you know, quickly jotting down expressions every time you hear them. Or is that the way you do it, or are you a very methodical person? You've got is it right. Nice? I'm not methodical in that sense. I don't carry a tape recorder. Hmm. I, I, Perhaps it's that I'm nervous about the technology, I don't know. Perhaps it's that I think it'll make people nervous. Or perhaps it's just that I'm so 
But I love so much when I hear an expression that I want to get it down right away so that it's not a matter of uh, uh, setting out as if I were on a work assignment, but more a, a question of living with people or being around people and keeping my ears open. Mm. Yeah, you're very much the, the miner chipping away at these rocks all over and you know, finding gold everywhere you treasure, turn. Treasure, treasure, it's treasure. Tell me about some of the, the richness and the beauty of, of the language in all of its colorful diversity. Well, uh, maybe we could move around among some of the different places that I've worked or areas that I've worked. Could, could you, can you call them speech communities? One of the things mm -hmm. about slang is that there's a close relationship between the person who speaks and the person who hears. They, they, and there's a reference, there's a clear reference that, and an attitude, a kind of attitude that's shared between the people. They may be interested in cars and motorcycles. I've done a book on car talk. They may be interested in airplanes. I've done a book called Plane Talk. They may be interested in hockey. I've done a book there, and I'm starting to work on cop slang. And oh my, the, uh, perhaps one of my favorites from, in, so let's say cop slang, for example, from the old, the stairs and the string, which is very, very old. I don't for, know what that means. For, for the steps up to the hangman, to the, to the hanging platform Ooh. and the string for the yes. hangman's news, yeah. to uh, the new rule in the states that a third time offender gets put away for life. He got the bitch for habitual criminal. He got the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so you get those shortened kind of colorful words happening there. Wow. <laughs> What about with television uh, dominating so much of our lives? And in some ways, of course, there's media talk, which has you know, seeped into our language. But in other ways, I get the feeling that, uh, that mass media might be depriving us somehow of some of the good localized kinds of languages because they become diminished as they become more standardized by mm. TV. Is that happening? I expect that may be one of the main effects although I used to be more worried about it than I do now because I heard last night someone referred to as a soup Nazi and I know that that came from television from Seinfeld, Seinfeld. <laughs> and it's now that. spread. Yeah. Yeah. It's curious what happens with slang. Um, a few slang terms become standard, become part of the standard language. I think hijack, you could say, has moved into more or less standard discourse. Yeah. Carjack is new slang. They're related. Sometimes terms move the other way, uh, but in almost every case there's a, a novel sounding synonym for a standard term for mm -hmm. in the slang that means that there's a kind of interpenetration between them. Uh, and all oh, the sources, the sources. The military has been credited with having after the Second World War in particular, men brought home terms from uh, the war and spread them all over, say, North America particularly. So non-military people are speaking yes. what were once military terms. Snafu, yeah. Flyboy, right. uh, Blitz uh, from Vietnam, uh, Gook, uh, Grunt, Charlie. You know, they're often impolite, they're often insulting, mm -hmm. they often express either admiration for a person, more often dislike for a person. Uh, There's a lot of that in slang, isn't there? The, the insult is going to have a, a huge lexicon <laughs> of its own. Or the, uh, you know, the foul word, the, uh, mm -hmm. something that's offensive is going to be a lot of that there too. A lot of synonyms for uh, explanations for the acronyms for air, airlines, like mm -hmm. uh, t for TWA, try walking across is one I remember. <laughs> Ford Fixer Repair Daily? Isn't that one of the old Yes, or yeah. found on the road dead. <laughs> we could keep going. Like first this on stuff. race day. <laughs> <laughs> Your own language origins. Let's uh, take you back to, uh, you grew up in the American Southwest. Yes, I was born in Oklahoma and went to school in, in, I started school in Texas, but then my parents took me to South Africa where uh, they were missionaries for five years. Oh, I see. And so I learned both Zulu and Afrikaans there. Zulu outside of school and Afrikaans in school in a bilingual system. Uh, and uh, so I, and my father also taught me the King James Version of the Bible. He taught me to read out of the King James Version of the you Bible come from before I went to school. Strong religious background? Dad was a preacher and missionary. Yeah. yeah. So the word, I guess I was attached to the word there, and it seemed natural that when I went to college I would study English and literature. Now on the back of one of your early books, uh, it was described that you were a preacher at 13. I was, a, yes, a, a person of the word when I was what 13, were you doing? briefly. 
Well, I was first talking about Africa. We had just come back, and when Dad would go around to raise money for the field, I would talk to the kids mm -hmm. in Sunday school. And so it got me in front of the audience, and uh, it was exotic for people in the Southwest. And before long, I was invited to go off on my own wow. on the bus and train all over the Southwest. Learning on your own how, how to do those, those speeches that uh, preachers give. Uh, yes, Were I you guess. Good at it? I think it was pretty informal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't dare to judge myself now by those, what my performance those days. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> now, how did you find your way to Canada? That's probably a long while after that. that uh, I was finishing my doctorate at Minnesota and got a job at Sir George Williams University in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And to tell the truth, and I'm a little bit ashamed to say this, I wasn't that aware that I was in an another country, that I was moving out of the States until I got here. Then I began to read Canadian literature and realized that for sure I had, and found myself delighted that I was in a bilingual province, a place where people spoke both languages. And this turned out, after the work on the South Shore, to be, what shall I say, the germ of the work on the hockey phrase book, as it was called. Now it's called Hockey Talk, which my son Aaron actually suggested to me because he said, there's a lot of stuff that I hear out here on the rink that no one has ever written down. And um, at, in about the, what, the third version of that book, which was originally published in Montreal, uh, I st we started to introduce French phrases, and uh, although the hockey in English, of course, hockey slang in English is very interesting. There are some regional differences between the states and 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 Canada yes. w when you go a ways back. But in French, you know, they call the goalie Cerber, which is a version of uh, Cerberus, the dog that guards the gates of oh, hell. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and the stick handling is tricoté, knitting. You know, so there's a kind of flair, even in. Uh, uh, in the French slang, even though hockey is mainly, 80% I would say, hockey slang is English. Now, with the different kind of slang or the, the subgroups of languages, there's a kind of exclusivity that can emerge between a group of people that, uh, that can speak that talk. They know that language, and that excludes outsiders who don't know what the heck they're talking about, whether it's car talk or plane talk or, or uh, street slang. How does that operate? Well, it seems to me that the, one of the points of slang, one of the reasons for the origins of slang, well, slang originally was defined as uh, thieves' talk, and so it was, the purpose was to provide secrecy and to conceal activities that you didn't want the police to find out about. Oh, right. So you can talk was, about it in front, of, uh, in, in front of strangers and they don't know what you're, you're talking about. But of course, because you have in-group membership and you sort of want to brag about it to friends, it will get out, and this, I suppose, provides a, an occasion for slang to be renewed because there's a need to change it over, to keep uh, uh, the, the secrecy. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's interesting working on police slang because the police know this, of course, and uh, there's a great deal of interpenetration of terms between the language of, of, of the prisoner and the language of the police, cops and or robbers, yes. in a sense, is... Uh, uh, there's kind of commonality there. Uh, so, and they're going to have to keep up on what the current language is, I suppose, if they're going to do their jobs as exactly. law enforcement officers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, it keeps evolving all the time. All kinds of terms that I keep hearing that I don't know what they mean may be related to computers or something like that. That I've got to keep my ear to the ground constantly. True. It's true. Yeah. I was going to say about police slang that a good number of the terms that we found, though, certainly are. Uh, uh, come from the police, not from the, for example, habeas grabus is a, an irreverent way to say habeas corpus. Mm. We put the, put, the, put the cuffs on him, you know, we, we put the old habeas grabus yes. on him. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, uh, a drop gun, which is, uh, I've been told, is <clears throat> in unethical police forces, a gun that you'd carry along just in case something happened at the scene of the crime and you wanted to make it uh, clear that there was some threat to the cops. Yes. You drop the gun. Okay, and we're going to drop the gun right now. We're going to take a short break and uh, we'll be back with Louis Potique talking about language right after this.
Hi, welcome back to Off the Page. My guest today is Louis Poteet. We're talking about language and all its great multiplicity. Uh, the big philosophical question here, how does language, the very language we use, shape our individual identity? Well, we uh, <clears throat> learn to talk from the people around us. We um, express ourselves because we grow up in a community. Um, we mark ourselves by the kind of language we use and we choose a level of informality depending on the person with whom we're talking. As I said earlier, slang involves a kind of familiarity between the two speakers which uh, helps them to say, well, I'm, you're like me, I'm like you, and we know what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. That shared language gives you a very strong and powerful bond, and it's not just mm -hmm. English, but it's some variation in English. When you're walking down the street and you see a, a bit of graffiti somewhere on the wall, what, what do you see as a scholar in this area, <laughs> aside from a little vandalism? I have started to work on graffiti. Uh, I'm interested in it as a, a sort of bridge between the spoken and the written, because it gets written on walls, but it's quite often um, things that would otherwise be said, statements about uh, political programs or anger. And um, the difference is, I think, that <clears throat> where what's written on, let's say, toilet walls tends to be very brutally clear, what's written on public walls often tends to be not that clear to anyone who doesn't know certain kinds of things, like the names of bands or the symbols of certain yes. bands or certain key words. And very often, the letters themselves are not clear, but are bulbous and decorative and colored and signed. More and more, graffiti has become a sort of art form in our time. That's what's interested me most recently. So you've been starting to take notes or writing. take some pictures? And yeah, I've, I've gone around taking, taking slides and uh, trying to see what's going on, although uh, I have to say that I'm as often mystified as I am uh, made clear about what's happening. Hmm. I, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, and the uncertainty, of course, when you see these things is that we're all trying to figure out what, what's going on there. What do the words mean? What are they talking about? There's a, a bit of ambiguity. If language is going to keep changing and evolving, um, how many years down the line might it be before the English language would be unrecognizable to you or me today? This is to a guess, I know, but yours would be an ex educated guess. To us, I'm not sure. Without uh, trying to be prideful, I have to say that we do try to stand as a people who read and write at some sort of juncture. But I've heard it said that already there are forms of English that English has spread so far and borrowed from so many different places and changed in so many ways in different places that it, you could almost say that it's not one language anymore. Right. That, that it really has. And if you look at even uh, uh, McNeil's The Story of English, you know, that, that series not uh, that long ago, that uh, the forms that English has taken almost make it into more than one language. Hmm. I'm interested in sort of the person who, the scholar who maybe is the opposite of you, someone who would love to see the language standardized and remain that way and would fight to keep it so. Why, why would some people, even the English professors of the world, English teachers of the world, be motivated to keep English standard and not change? <laughs> When I was in graduate school, one of the older graduate students said to me, the function of librarians is to hide books. I would say that the oh, function yeah. of yeah. a professor like that is to hate language. <laughs> yeah. I love language. And, and, I, and it seems to me that if you truly love not just funny words, but, uh, but, but colorful words, and you're interested in communication, then uh, you're going to have to drop that sense of standard to some degree, maybe not when you're marking papers yes. or telling people how to write a job application, but uh, the whole point is to get the, the meaning across. I've been working on plain talk, and I was listening to the John Glenn, some of the description of the John Glenn launch. The oh yeah, what, what is he saying up and, there from space? Oh, it was the, uh, it was, uh, the Mission Control Central who was talking about a slight delay in the launch, and he talked about going uphill, which I'm sure they've used before. It, it, there's an area in which there's probably a lot of technical 
uh, language that could be used. But going uphill is intelligible to everybody. Now, what did it mean in this case? Uh, ascent. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. Lift off. <laughs> gotcha now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And he also talked about being something that was in the box. I remember there was a delay because some small aircraft had strayed into the box. Oh, yes. And in the box means that no fly zone mm -hmm. that uh, <clears throat> would put any potential plane in danger during the takeoff. Wow. Um, I'll give you a little quiz on some of the things there that I was looking for in your books. Uh, in car talk, what is a fine tuner? Oh, a fine tuner is a jocular uh, way to say a sledgehammer or, a, or you know something to pound with a whop stick. It's yeah. also called. Yeah. So I can see some mechanic who's who's been working on an engine for a long time and it's just not, <laughs> not coming together, working out well. So he gets out the fine tuner. The fine tuner. Yeah. In um, in hockey, laying on the lumber. Laying on the lumber is using the stick, but not just to uh, artfully maneuver the puck. It's. Um, uh, not just good stick handling, it's hitting somebody with a stick or high sticking them or as they say in Quebec, giving them six inches of good wood, propping the <laughs> stick against the sideboard so that they run into it. Well, they have that in French too, donnez si pouce, to give them six inches. Okay. Uh, in plain talk, what is toilet seat flying? Oh, <laughs> that's from inside. I think it was a cabin attendant who said, when you get one of those short, uh, uh, an assignment to a set of short flights where you're not in the takeoff have a long flight and then land, but you're up and down, up and down, up and down all the time, as people are quite often in these little flights in the Maritimes. Call it because it's up and down, up and down, the toilet seat flight. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I get it. And back here close to home where we're at in Nova Scotia on the South Shore, a Digby chicken? Uh, a herring before they take the head off and the guts out. Before they head said off to and me, guts out. As the Frenchman says. <laughs> I don't think he meant French at all. He yeah. simply meant, as the Frenchman says, is her ritual way of saying, Open up your ears. This one's going to be funny. Okay. <laughs> and a pothead is not necessarily a, a pot smoker. No, a pothead is the twine at the end of the lobster pot that's larger at one end and smaller at the other so that the lobster crawls in and doesn't crawl out, I've been told. There it is. And a lot of German phrases, uh, because there's a German community in the South Shore, found their way into the language. Uh, My favorite one is divil abyssal. The what devil, does that mean? The devil a little bit. <laughs> and there's a lot of good ones out there. We're going to take a, another short break and we'll be back with Louis Potit right after this. off the page today. My guest has been Louis Poteet. Uh, Louis, one final thing here about uh, language. In what way is language a liberating tool, both personally and politically? A liberating tool? Yes. Because it gets us out of ourselves and into a community, I think. Because we reach outside of whatever it is that's bothering us in our heads, if anything's bothering us, and we touch another person, and we get a response, either with um, something that we're trying for, with a facial expression, with something that we're looking for, just that human contact. It's, it's been defined as what makes us human. Mm, and very and, powerful tool that it is. Yeah. Thanks very much for coming on our show today. Thank you. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice. I'll see you again next time.